Well, today is going to be a shorter but sweeter episode, because you know, in sci-fi, there are a million and one ways to get from space down to a planet's surface. Everything from the gentle and beautiful way that Trek teleports like the pansies they are, to the precise and efficient way that dropships carry mechs, men, and weapons into combat in Battletech, to the various shuttles and transports of Mass Effect and beyond. But you know what the, by far, most violent, silly, and balls-to-the-wall adrenaline-fueled method you could possibly pick is. It's drop pods, because of course it had to be drop pods. I mean, look at these things. The ones from Halo are essentially one-man coffins meant to hand-deliver you to an untimely demise, or maybe deliver you to someone else's, depending on how unlucky they are when you come in for a landing. And the ones we see from 40k, like, they're carrying a bunch of roided out super soldiers, and they're the definition of I will punch your fist with my face style of energy. They're just the most perfect encapsulation of the ridiculousness that sci-fi can pump out. So today, we're gonna be talking about them. The most violent form of combat-ready re-entry vehicle the aspiring infantryman or greebly bug monster could ask for. I'll be talking about how to distinguish a drop pod from any other more sane kind of transport, going over a few of the key features of them that make them even remotely survivable, and sharing a few examples of my favorites from all across sci-fi. Before we fully dive into things, however, introductions! Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of sci-fi and all its incredible stupidity to you, the viewer. In today's case, Arguably one of the most stupid things in sci-fi, but also undoubtedly one of the coolest. Psy also has a Discord if you're interested where you can hang out with a small community of fellow turbo nerds and sci-fi enthusiasts linked in the description. And with that, let's talk about drop pods. I want to start with the definition, because there is a little variation in them and they range from one person and small to carrying an entire school bus of crayon eaters level of big, so they get a little confused sometimes in what I've seen on forums, discussions, and stuff. Drop pods have a singular, blatant distinction that separates them from every other method of transport that you find in sci-fi. It's not the number of guys they can carry, like I mentioned, 40k drop pods carry 10 entire dump trucks worth of walking tanks. Titanfall drop pods carry anything from squads of grunts and robots to mini-mechs to a single dude. And it's not how armored or armed they are. For example, there are plenty of drop pods that can start blasting the moment they touch down, a la Helldiver's hand delivering a turret to the enemy's front yard. No, it is in fact something so painfully simple that I guess most people just overlook it when they're trying to come up with hard definitions. Drop pods only go one direction, straight down. They do not take you back up and often are not really capable of maneuvering as they're going straight down. So something like the Driller from Deep Rock Galactic is not a drop pod, and it's capable of going to landing on, or I guess in the case of the game, landing in the planet of Hoxies 4, and then coming back up. It's also a massive cargo container meant to haul dwarves, rock, and stone. Rock and stone! For rock and stone! Rock and roll and stone! For rich! For rich! So while it looks like a really big four-person version of a drop pod, it's closer to a drill-shaped uh, landing craft and we'll just shove it off to the side. If it can go back up, it's probably a dropship or a shuttle. Drop pods only move one direction, and if you want a second rule, they're mostly disposable. Once you use them, you just leave them as scrap on whatever planet they hit. And now with that incredibly simple definition expertly explained, how in the name of every god out there does anyone ever survive travel in these things? I mean, if you really look at them, the average occupant should be a smear of red jam across the bottom of the pod the moment they make impact. At the very best, you'd expect them to be walking around with every bone in their lower body broken, but no, most of the time they can jump out no issues immediately after and start fighting with the best of them. Or in the case of Helldivers, they jump out and immediately start sacrificing for Super Earth, but that's another issue. Careful, you... No, oh, no, that's good. Right. That's good. Extra kinematic. Uh, mm. Let's take Halo as an example, specifically ODSTs. At the bare minimum, in the video game, Halo 3 ODST, Buck and the player character the Rookie should be dead. 
Buck doesn't even land correctly. He goes careening off after clipping the edge of a building and speed runs like a thousand car crashes at once. This man should be a statistic. No, no, no. He should have ascended well past a red jam. He is a pink mist scattered across this entire street after a landing like that. The Rookie, as well, has a rough descent where he's treated to the Blender Special after another pod slams into him, after which he also experiences a rough landing on the edge of a bridge, or building or something, whatever it was. Both of them should be signed into the Afterlife Hotel, and yet, they immediately go on to start blasting coveys and saving the day. Sorta kinda. Though, who knows, maybe the rookie is just made of depleted uranium or something, considering he soaks a multi-story fall right after waking up and walks it off like a champ. Like, that's that's three stories, my guy. That's that, Maybe that's four stories. You should be insta-dead when you hit the ground from that kind of fall, but whatever. Just a head but a med kit, I guess you'll be fine. But this brings up an interesting question about them. Because drop pods are supposed to be a form of incredibly rapid, semi-stealth insertion behind enemy lines or where they least expect it, in order to do that, they need to be moving at mock Jesus in order to make use of their small size to get around or under anti-air fire, fighters, missiles, and more, trying to stop a landing exactly like that. Most drop pods, in fact, are moving so fast that it's extremely common to see them depicted trailing a plasma fireball behind them as the air in front of them cannot get out of the way fast enough. We see this in pretty much every sci-fi setting, actually. This is like the one thing I think is consistent for every drop pod everywhere. They're always going down in a glorious fireball. 40k, Halo, Helldivers, my beloved, and a criminally underloved sci-fi shooter called Section 8, that IP is dead now, but man, was it awesome. Even in that setting, you didn't even have a drop pod. They just kicked you out the side of an airlock and said, figure out a landing strategy in your power armor. If you couldn't figure out a landing strategy, then landing on the enemy also sufficed to break your fault. That game was awesome. I'm so sad it's dead. But like I was saying, these things move incredibly fast. But unlike re-entry vehicles we use in real life, drop pods aren't aimed in these long, shallow paths like real life to burn off as much speed as possible and then deploy parachutes and stuff. They're going straight down. They are aiming to lawn dart directly into the planet. And as such, they need some way to slow down, otherwise re-entry would turn immediately into pieces. Most commonly, the way that they do this is rockets. Very, very powerful rockets on the bottom of them. Or a hell of a lot of rockets all over the pod. When the pod actually gets far enough down to no longer be in immediate danger, fire those retro rockets, slam the poor occupant with like, I don't know, 20 Gs of acceleration to slow the pod down, and hope that they're actually moving at a somewhat survivable velocity when they hit the dirt. Generally though, this works great if you've got plenty of time to slow down, or you're some kind of genetically modified post-human monster, because then you can fire those rockets right before you impact and minimize the time you spent under threat of copious amounts of explosions. That's how the 40k space marines do it. They wait until they're basically about to hit the ground, and because all of the space marines are, like I mentioned, post-human monsters, they can survive that kind of thing, what with their titanium bones and multiple hearts. But for regular people, well, we see things like parachute analogs. For the ODSTs, they get these pathetic little drag shoots that are meant to convince said ODSTs they are not about to become the second state of matter upon touchdown. Or we see much more reasonably from Titanfall that they actually do slow down a lot before touchdown and then deploy a parachute. The point of things like this is to slow down the pod by atmospheric drag, the same way our real-life re-entry vehicles do it. They're not meant to slow the descent enough to be comfortable when they land. The capsules and stuff that splash down in the oceans all over Earth, they're meant to slow down with those huge parachutes enough that you could feasibly walk away from that, like just a normal person picks themselves up and trudges off. No, no, no. The ones you see in sci-fi, they're meant to slow the pod down enough that they don't immediately implode upon impact. Assuming, somehow, that sci-fi magics its way out of a problem and just goes nuh -uh, to physics and the fact that you probably shouldn't be walking away from most of these things, let's, let's assume that you've landed safely. You are then facing a few incredibly terrible situations. You might land in a swamp 
or on top of a building, or a debris pile from said building, or the ocean, or directly into the center of an enemy camp. You don't really know where you're landing with these things. So if you're landing in an area that's not exactly conducive to getting out of your pod once you land, how do the various sci-fi settings go about handling the issue and motivating the soldier to actually step out into active gunfire? Well, let's start with the classic. Explosives! Lots of explosives, like an unhealthy amount of them. It's incredibly common to see drop pods in sci-fi have their doors equipped with detonation bolts or explosive charges that quite literally rip the door and sometimes the whole pod apart and send it careening into whatever's around you probably other friendlies if you're dropping in a large group. And the reason that this is a super common design choice is that drop pods more often than not, like I said, would lawn dart themselves deep enough into whatever they're landing in that the human occupants, even if they're superhuman, wouldn't be strong enough to push the door open. You might have tons of earth, or millions of tons of water if you are rapidly sinking, or all kinds of rubble and debris that would prevent a person from pushing the pod open far enough that they could actually get out. So all of these explosives essentially rip the door free of the pod, taking any choice away from the occupant, and basically saying, get in there, champ because you're sure as shit not hiding in this anymore. Sometimes though, for very large drop pods, like in 40k, they're so big and they have such a wide surface area that they just stick like a dozen doors onto it and then open them like a flower petal. So even if the pod lands weird or most of it is blocked or it's like hugging the inside of a building, there's going to be at least one open door for people to file out of. And if they land properly, there's tons of different angles that all of the marines inside can rush out and into combat from. And sometimes we see stuff like Helldivers, where the pod buries itself entirely into the dirt as its goal, gets you a few extra feet to decelerate by doing it that way, and saves you any of those other unnecessary methods of disembarking by just vomiting you at the top of the drop pod. And I honestly think the Helldiver pod is like one of the best single person versions of this that I've seen because it's incredibly reasonable if you just stop to think about it for a few seconds. Take a step back, like I've said, Drop pods only move in one direction, down. And even if they're hitting something, kick the person out directly above. The drop pod probably punched a giant hole through whatever it was it hit, so problem solved. There's no obstructions or anything in the way. The last kind of drop pod that I wanted to talk about are these squishy, disgusting kinds that just make your skin crawl that bio empires and bug swarms use. The Flood, the Zerg, the Tyranids, you know the kind. These are a little different because they've got no tech to keep them alive, and they're essentially intentional meat grinders that are going to kill some or most of their occupants upon re-entry, but the rules for them are different because they don't care so much about individual lives. Those bio-empires are often sending drop pods full of stuff that is both far more resistant to impacts, but also aren't exactly alive in the sense we would think of it. Take flood drop pods, for example. Oh sure, they can transport full infection forms, sometimes, but more often than not, it's just a pod full of, like, evil bacteria and spores and liquid super cancer. But it doesn't really matter if 90% of that payload is disintegrated on re-entry or impact, as long as some of it survives, well, that's good enough for them. It works. Or in the case of stuff like the Tyranids and the Zerg, they love filling their pods with lots of soft, squishy, disgusting things like Ripper Swarms for the Tyranids or Broodlings for the Zerg. Oh, sure, most of them are gonna die on the way down, or, you know, when they hit the ground, but it's fine. They've got like 500 in each pod and thousands more pods following along behind, so it's not really an issue. Casualties are a mere afterthought. Plus, for most biomorph monstrosities like this in sci-fi, they just, they just eat the dirt wherever they go. So if, or I guess once they win, they just hoover up all the dead bugs and hey presto, no troop losses, you've just got more biomass for the spawning pools. So the rules are different for biological horrors than regular sci-fi empires, and they, they, they don't really count for all the same restrictions. Overall though, drop pods are just pure balls to the walls energy that exist only for the rule of cool. There really is no way to make something like this work in its intended role while keeping the average person inside alive. There's just so many random bits that wouldn't work or would be pointless or would be such a hassle that you'd be better off just using an actual proper dropship or shuttle or something if they ever made these. Of course, this is science fiction, so a very common response is to just go, no, 
space magic, and then stick one of the various post-human super soldiers into it. Or just add shields or something, I don't know. Shields are the flex tape of sci-fi. Slap that shit on everything, it's fixed. And last but not least, let me quickly go over a few designs that I really, really love. The Titanfall 2 drop pods, fantastic. I love all of them, from the single man ones, to the really big drill looking ones that carry whole squads of robots, to the ones that are just essentially a shipping container that delivers a mini mech into the game. They're fantastic. I love them since they're also not really meant to get to the ground behind enemy lines while under fire. They're more meant to deploy men and bots to form an initial front line and then a landing zone for the bigger shuttles we see. Plus, like I mentioned, hey look, an actual parachute. 40k drop pods are also just a personal favorite of mine because they're, they're so chunky. And like everything in that setting, they're an absolute joke. They're like clown cars. One lands down, and a small army of roided out supermen come running out waving chainswords and thunder hammers like lunatics. It brings me such joy to know that these things exist in the setting. And last one, kind of an honorable mention, because I don't know if it actually is my favorite, but the drop pods from Helldivers 2 are fantastic, from the way that they literally fire you out of a cannon rather than any form of proper launching mechanism, to the way that you land and you get that metallic thunk as the plate at the top gets blown off. Just, oh, it's perfect. I love it. But I don't know if it's really my favorite. It might just be that I've been playing the game a little bit recently and I really enjoy it. And that brings me to the end of the video. If you've managed to make it this far, you are clearly the target audience and a fellow nerd, so why not help the channel out a little bit by leaving a like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, all that stuff, since it really does help a smaller channel like this out, and check out some of our other content. You might find some other stuff you're interested in. Plus, nothing motivates quite like seeing numbers go up. This is surprisingly addicting. And to the people going above and beyond to support the channel, a huge thanks to all of Psy's patrons. The gullible itty, I mean generous saints donating to my staying alive fund. The arms dealers who provided all the drop pods in today's discussion for testing and hands-on experience. The food merchants who finally managed to resurrect my missing co-host from the dead by cramming stale food down his throat until he gets up. Good job guys, he'll be back in the next video and the coffee vendors supplying me with an unlimited number of double doubles to keep me editing long into the night. With bonus thanks to the new guy, Drew Dyerwood. Thank you very much for your support. And to everybody, I really appreciate it, it means a lot. And with that, the video is over. Now that Steve is finally returning, we're going back to Stargate to talk about some of the dumbest ships in all of sci-fi. Hope you're excited to learn about the totally not a pyramid ships. Outros are hard, goodbye.